Welcome to Bike Life, the show that you may remember was called something slightly different, but we've had to change the name because of a few, well, there, there are enough legal cases going on at the moment, let's not dwell on it. What's coming up? Right. Um, so, in the show, we're at uh, British Superbikes, and we were up in Darlington um, in North East Yorkshire uh, with Zoe. We were catching up with our usual crew and seeing who was doing what and where and how. And I've been catching up with Kawasaki, who have been seeing a bit of a resurgence um, in their fortunes. They've had a great start to the 2011 season. So I made my way to Colchester to meet with team boss Nick Morgan. And I've been catching up with Brit actor and bike enthusiast Joel Beckett. And then um, I've just got back. We were down in Swindon at George White's uh, doing the bike test that we talked about last uh, in the last episode. So I found some likely lads and we went out and we tested the BMW uh, S1000RR, the Kawasaki ZX10 and the brand new Aprilia RSV4 factory. Um, and that's coming up in the show. Great stuff. And one of the things that um, biking is seeing a great resurgence in is classic bikes. So I found um, a guy who has got a very rare motorcycle indeed, a Bimota SB3, and he talked me through how he's going to do a light restoration job on it. So, Soph, come on, CBT, where are you at? Oh, I've come so far since we last spoke. Um, I've come this far, in fact. Yes, this is the X402 GT Elegance Encom. It's got a composite fibre shell, quick-release visor mechanism and unitherm light racing comfort, as well as internal vision protection system with scratch and fog-resistant treatment. And just like any good Blue Peter presenter, here it here is. It is. <laughs> yeah, you look at that. I love this helmet. Now this is a fantastic it's a new x light and you know at the end of the day i am now in good company jorge lorenzo wears this marco melandri John how Kirkham. can i go wrong yeah, Kirkham wears Kirkham, one of, those, of yeah. course yeah. it's got everything it's got he's even got a little spoiler on the back so <laughs> that's not a spoiler <laughs> but <laughs> so what it has got yeah, uh, yeah is what i like about this is that it's um it's an open face helmet but with a detachable chin guard it is indeed so it means that Oh, Basically, there you go, you can just clip this out, ta-da. I did actually, talking of Jorge Lorenzo as we mentioned earlier, I caught up with him back in December and had a little chat about the, well, let's put it this way, his X-Lite is a little bit more special. Your very famous helmet with however many Swarkovsky crystals, how many crystals? 1,800. Lot of <laughs> A lot of few stars and really, really expensive, yeah. You can buy it, can't you? I will try not to crash so much time, so many times with the helmet, for sure. <laughs> but people can buy it, can't they? People and can buy. It's, uh, the truth is that it's quite expensive. It's uh, uh, 12,000 euros. But uh, you really have a very special helmet. And it's a helmet that uh, anyone, anyone or uh, only a, a few people will have. And you will 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 feel like uh, you are the king of the of the street. <laughs> yeah, because you won't look conspicuous in a helmet like that, will you? So from bling to dirt, really. What are you talking about? Yeah. So one of the things that I've been up to this week is I got myself down to Docklands to have a look at the motocross action. What's up, UK? I'm Nate Adams. <laughs> London's Docklands motocross track, did a little freestyle demo, got in some laps. Whether you're a fan of motocross, freestyle, or just action in extreme sports, come check us out. 2nd of July, Monster Energy Extreme Freestylers, Millennium's Cardiff Stadium. Let's see what we got going on, extremefreestylers.com. So, British Superbikes, we were at Croft um, with Zoe. Let's see how she got on. It's a cold, windy and wet day for the third instalment of the British Superbike Championships. We're here at Croft today. Let's see what we've got in store. So, Michael, you did really well in the qualifiers yesterday and you're fourth in the first row. That must feel pretty good. Yeah, you know, uh, we're happy to get the, the rapid by them to catch up there on the, on the front row first time this year. So uh, we're working hard on the electronics to get the, the bike uh, how we want it. Uh, we had this new package at the beginning of uh, this year and it's... Um, it's not easy to ride at the moment, so it's getting better, but um, you know, we're using racing as testing and um, we haven't really done a race run. We want to do one this morning and uh, the weather conditions haven't really let us, so uh, 
yeah, it's a bit of a gamble for the race, but uh, hopefully we can, you know, be up somewhere up the front. Gary, am I right in thinking this is your first ever podium at BSB? Yeah, it is. Obviously, I had the ones in the Privateers Cup, my first, putting the proper championship. It is. But all respect, obviously, uh, Kawasaki and the MSS Colchester boys for building a bike that's capable of, you know, doing that. You know, I thought I was out there, and obviously, I wanted the race win, but. It was just so dodgy. They were on uh, into front, into rear, and I was on full slick. So they just had that bit more confidence to run it into the turn. I was trying at a few moments, but hey, I have needed the points as well. So really happy, obviously, with the finish and looking forward to this afternoon's race. Now, John, that was your first ever BSB win. How amazing. You must be feeling brilliant. Well, it was my first BSB podium as well, so I've, first podium, we'll just have a win, let's go for it. So I couldn't believe it, like we started, started the weekend and we missed a few sessions, so we were on the back foot a little bit. I've heard that you're particularly good in these conditions, but you said you don't like them, but you're good at them, so... Yeah, they're just sort of, you're just tiptoeing around all the time, if you know what I mean. It's like, it's like driving your car on ice, you just, the, the tyres didn't feel like they were connecting at all, the whole the whole sort of time. Uh, it's quite terrifying. Yeah, you, when you're sort of not in control a, a little to a certain extent, it is, it is a bit terrifying. And I had a, a few scares like last couple of laps and I just thought, I thought if I crash, at least I'm in the lead try. And I, but um, yeah, luckily, I, the, the, the moments that I did have, they were only sort of slight moments. They weren't like big, big scary ones. So just ecstatic. When we were on the grid, I, I, said to, um, I said to Hopper's crew chief, actually, I said, I think we've got a fantastic tyre combination between both riders because we had intermediate tyres on Hopper's and we had an intermediate front and a, and a rear slick tyre on uh, JK's. Uh, there's no lying water on the track, um, so JK chose to go with the, uh, the slick tyre. So obviously, as long as you can maintain the temperature, if the track starts to dry a little bit, he's going to get a little bit more grip, which is what he did at the end because uh, Hopper made a late charge, but then JK had a little bit more grip out of Tower Bend and, and, and got the lead back. So, um, you know, we had, a, we had a, a great combination. The team did uh, a really good job in helping the riders select the, those, those combination of tyres. And, um, you know, that coupled with two great rides for, from the riders, I mean, we, we got the result we wanted. So, Paul... Um What's happening in British Superbikes? Amazing. Let's start with John Kirkham, his first win. Wow, what a race. Incredible. And it was just fascinating to watch because was it a dry race? Was it a wet race? The guys, I mean, you remember, the guys were running out with wets and then they were putting inters on and some were running in slicks. Yeah. Gary ran, Gary Mason ran slicks, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. Which worked for him. It shows you how exciting British Superbikes is as a series, how competitive and how close it is. You know, it's not just the same teams on the podium. You know, mm. we've had six races so far and we've had five different people on the top step of the podium. So, um, and then obviously Shane Byrne, Shaggy Byrne, it was unfortunate engine blowing up in race one, but needless to say, he put in a storming performance. Yeah, the, and you know. you know the top of the table is all pretty tight. You know, there's uh, there's not much in it. Um, and then we've got to talk about post that race, Stuart Easton, who you know had a terrible crash at the Northwest 200. It's so depressing. I mean, so what's the situation then? So, um, his um, got the detail. Yeah, I've yeah. got the press release here actually. So I've got this direct from um, fr from the Kawasaki guys, um, and I think it's it's pretty common knowledge now. But he's broken both his. Uh, Femurs. Both of them? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Shattered his pelvis in five places. Um, he's broken his coccyx, ruptured, ruptured a bowel, um, broken some fingers, and he's got quite a deep cut to one of his arms. So I think he's going into uh, to surgery on um, on uh, Friday or this week. Yes. So, you know, we have to wish uh, Stuart well and, um, you know, <clears throat> send our condolences, of course. Yeah. Uh, wish him a speedy recovery. Um, and that leaves a kind of slightly uncomfortable situation um, for the MSS Colchester yeah. Kawasaki team, but um, you got the news that um, Alex so Lowe's. Lowe's. Yeah, I mean, we would normally want to talk about Alex anyway. Well, you only have to look at his performance, as you say, over the first three rounds, you know, 145 points, you know, um, so leading the Mirror.co.uk Evo Championship by uh, a country mile, kind of challenging for kind of top six positions within main superbikes on a on a bike that's not a patch on them really, and yeah. <clears throat> you know, riding the wheels off that thing. And then on the other hand, poor Jenny. We yeah, you know, we don't know the circumstances behind no. that. This is the news that uh, Jenny Timmouth is no longer going to be riding for Splitlath Aprilia. Very short, just says that, um, and this was uh, just yesterday to say that um, 
to Blit Laffer confirming that um, they parted company with Jenny. It was a mutual uh, decision between both parties. And John Dimble Yo, who's the team manager for Split uh, is wishing her the best of luck for the future. Um, and just says that sorry things haven't worked out. Well, we both know John. Um, I think uh, we'll try and catch up with him this weekend at Thruxton and see if we can get some more on that and to really to see if we can find out what Jenny's going to be doing. Colchester, situated on the River Colne in Essex near the east coast, is the oldest recorded Roman town in Britain. A bustling market centre, Colchester boasts a castle, a zoo and many other appealing points of interest. It's from Colchester that the story of Humpty Dumpty originates, as does the rhyme, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. If you follow the river out of the town centre, you bump into MSS Colchester Kawasaki, and it's here that Kawasaki's official UK superbike team developed the racing bikes that so many fans of British superbikes follow. MSS Colchester Kawasaki is famous in the southeast as the destination for all things Kawasaki. As a busy retail outlet, it services its wide customer base with the largest range of bikes and accessories around. Running a superbike race team is an expensive and time-consuming activity. The bikes have to be developed to compete at the highest level. Teams of technicians and support staff travel the land from race to race. The riders need to be the best in the business to extract the most from the machines and provide useful input. And financially, it all has to make sense. The MSS Colchester and Kawasaki UK relationship has been a successful one for many years. Previously as MSS Discovery, the race team focused on Supersport and had a number of podium places. It was in 2007 that Nick Morgan's team became the official Kawasaki UK Superbike offering. With the British Superbike season still in its early stages, we caught up with Nick Morgan, team principal, to listen to his take on the constantly changing world of superbike racing. So Nick, congratulations, what a fantastic day. Um, a second, a third, a first, talk us through it all. Yeah, I mean, it's been fantastic, you know, I mean, everything's just been sort of just, just going so well, even since before brands really, you know, from pre-season testing, brands to here, it's just been awesome, really has, the whole team's baking. And you're second in the championship, I bet this time a couple of weeks ago, you couldn't have dreamt of that. No, for sure. I mean, you know, to be honest, it's all, you know, you want it, that's what you come here for. You come here to win, you know, you don't come here to make the numbers up, but to sort of be second round in, second in the championship, it's just fantastic. You know, it's, it's like I said just now, the whole team is absolutely, you know, they've worked so hard for it and, they, you know, we all deserve it. I really do believe it, you know. No, I mean, it's, look, it's been a long story. It's been a long, hard slog for you and, uh, you know, it's great to see you now prevailing. You know, I'm not surprised that the bike is doing well at Superstock, but how did you get the Superbike working so well in such a short period of time? To be honest, you know, we had the bikes quite early last year. We had them in October, which is you know, quite unusual. Normally they don't come through to sort of like January, you know, early January. Um, and we've had a lot of help um, from the Paul Bird team. Just, just, you know, not trackside or anything like that when we were testing, but more to the point, just, just accelerating the development of parts, you know. So we sort of, we got to the, we got to the end result a lot quicker because, um, you know, typically it can take up to sort of two, three, four months to develop parts. And, you know, we've been sort of, you know, straight, short line in that and uh, it's, um, it's just working, you know, as you can see, it's good. And uh, just talk us through that moment that uh, Josh Brooks came flying over the top of uh, Stuart Easton. Yeah, well, that's not the first time we've had a little altercation with Josh, you know, a couple of years ago with Simon, uh, we had a little small incident there. I mean, it's, it's racing, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not pointing the finger, but uh, it was certainly heart-stopping stuff, you know, it, it's just, you know, Josh is trying hard, you know, all the boys are trying hard, and, uh, you know, that was, that was a, certainly a close moment. And it's, you know, the downside for us was it brought the pace car out, you know, and um, you just feel that Stuart sort of had, you know, he had a little bit of a gap there, him and Josh together, and, uh, you know, if we could have possibly been uh, top step there. And what happens now? So you'll go back to Colchester. What happens to the bikes? Talk us through the kind of next couple of weeks until the next round. 
Yeah, flat out really, back to sunny Essex and we've got, a, you know, we've got a lot of work to get through over the next sort of seven to ten days before we go back up to Croft. Um, we've also got the Northwest 200 sort of back to back with Croft so we need to sort of get a lot of, uh, a lot of work completed. We'll, we'll go through the bikes, analyse some data to see where we could have made some more time up here. Obviously we come back here later in the year so it's, it's crucial to get all of, the, uh, all of your figures right. Um, and we'll do some dyno work and just generally go through everything, sort of sit down with the lads, have a good debrief and uh, see where we are really. Great, well look, we're chuffed for you, so congratulations Nick, great Brilliant. to see you on the uh, top step of the podium. Lovely, thanks very much. Mate. Cheers. Okay, so Joel, thank you for coming into our salubrious studio here. It's my pleasure. It's we'll my make pleasure. it short and sweet because we're going to get very hot. <laughs> it's a little warm. <laughs> How are you? All I'm good? very well, yeah, very good, thanks. Yeah. Now... Everybody obviously knows you from your uh, acting, but I love this about them. The more and more people you meet, all of a sudden, this passion comes out for the bikes. Oh, yes. So come on, where did your passion begin for um, I think I had my first bike when I was six. Uh, and I remember what it was. It was a Malaguti 50cc scrambler. And I was lucky enough to have quite a big back garden. And I just remember there was just this ring of mud as I just rode it round and round and round and round, and then um, I cleaned it with petrol and set fire to the garage. So that was the end of that. And there was a little bit of a gap between my next bike, because obviously my father was like, I don't think we're gonna buy you another one of those. So, um, Gap yeah. of what, 20 years? It was, when about, you could buy it it was about, it was about <laughs> ten, 10 years, yeah. 10 years, and then, um, then we moved to a little farm, and um, we had these three wheeled bikes, these three wheeled 200, they were little trikes, um, but they were actually mobility scooters. So they had, they had gear sticks on them and you, could, you didn't do it with a pedal, you did it with a stick, but they didn't sort of restrict the speed. So God knows if anyone actually got them, they had like a sort of disabled seat, but they were just trikes with a stick on them and they went really fast. So we had those. My next bike I found in the field and um, that bike, unfortunately, uh, perished uh, this time because I lent it to my godfather who came over for the day and he said can I have a go I've never had a go on a bike and I went yeah and I told him what to do and I still got the image in my mind um, he basically he, he started off in a field and he didn't ask me how to turn so he went straight straight through a fence straight through a hedge straight over the main road and into a ditch and broke his arm and then, and then that's right. And then I went away, university, blah, 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 drama school, etc. And I came back and I didn't tell my parents. My mum's a bit of a proper mum and she hates bikes. She absolutely hates them. Well, that's because you set fire to a garage, you've I left said, ring marks know, all I around know, her I garden. Know. And uh, so the only decent <laughs> thing to do was to go and take my bike test in secret, which is what I did. I think you're probably not the only one that's ever done that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then I made the mistake of the following day. I, I did it over a weekend, passed on the Monday morning. Monday afternoon, went down the bike shop, bought a bike. I bought a Suzuki Bandit and uh, I bought the leathers, bought the helmet, bought everything. And I made the mistake of travelling up to see my mum. And I knocked at the door. <laughs> I just knocked the door with my helmet on and everything. Just knocked at the door and went, hi. And instead of sort of this, hi, she just burst out crying and I was like oh god I've done it again so uh, yeah that didn't get on very well uh, and so to combat that I sold the bandit and bought a CBR 600 I'm not a speed freak although I like going I like going fast but I'm not I'm not I'm not a track man I enjoy the whole experience of going for a day's riding with friends I actually enjoy the bit you know, if you're camping or if you're, I mean, the bit where you pull up at a pub. I love the bit where if there's 10 of you and you all pull up at the pub, and I know it's a bit kind of people looking at you, but I do love the way everyone turns around and you feel really like, yeah, we've arrived. And that whole convoy thing, I really, really dig. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. Um, and it's, it's just a great way to have fun. So I have to finish off then by saying, you know, uh, with all of this, where do you go? For, is this a passion that's going to be with you till the very bitter end? Yes. I, I, I love motorcycles. I'm very happy with my little scooter. It does me very well, but it's, it's that itch is coming back. Um, and I've recently moved to the country, and there are some beautiful roads, and I'm just kind of biding my time.
I think we may have to get you on some testing. I think so. Very much looking forward to it. And I hope that James doesn't watch the part where you said, um, I'm not that m impressed by tracks. Yeah. I'm fine with <laughs> no, I, yeah. track days. That's going to be the first thing he'll get you on. Yeah, no, it is. So I look forward <laughs> to learning how to ride on a track. Perfect. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming. Thanks Lovely a lot. Lovely to Cheers. meet you. Thank you. The year is a long time in motorcycling technology these days. Traction control is already seen as de rigueur for any new superbike model and power levels are set to increase. Yet what does this all mean in the real world? Exploiting the true performance of any litre bike on the road is going to end in no end of trouble. Equally, not all track day enthusiasts ride at a level where traction control can make a difference. So what are these bikes like for the average road rider? To find out, we headed down to George White Motorcycles in Swindon and invited two self-confessed average riders, both lacking in recent experience, to test the current crop of top draw litre superbikes, the BMW S1000 RR, the Aprilia RSV4 factory and the Kawasaki ZX10R. Well, um, for me, it was the Kawasaki. Um, absolutely loved it. it was the first bike I got on um, to get off to where we were going, and I instantly felt at home on it. Uh, it felt comfortable. Um, everything about it was great. Power was smooth, brakes were very sharp, uh, nice front end, very solid, and I straight away loved the power delivery. Thought it was gorgeous. Matt, after riding all the three bikes, that was the one I thought I want to get back on this and really try and push it a bit more. Well, it was like the first bike I was on. Uh, I prefer the BMW. It just seems to have everything right. It handled very well. Was was very sharp. Loved the brakes once you got used to them. They had a little bit of a yes. frightening one yeah, at first. Yeah, they were very got on it once you got them. They do, but they're, they're up to me. They're, they're, they were much more confident and inspiring than the other brakes. If you were taking that bike to work, if you were going out for a fun weekend, or even going touring, for me, if I, if I had to part with that sort of money, that's that's the bike that I have. Let's talk about the Aprilia. Yep. Because yes. That's the thing that certainly most open news reviewed it unbelievably well. Um, I found it like it was very different. And yeah. Characteristics. I, I rode it first, and it was like sitting on an atomic bomb. Yes. Very, very talky, yeah. very lively. I got used to it, but because the conditions are so windy out there today, I think the first thing I noticed was that the wind protection was minimal. Yep. Yeah. If nothing at all. So I yes. really felt like I was having to hang on to it. Yeah. Great to have ridden it. Yes. Calm day. But on a drive, you get a bit of wet yeah, out there today. I had it when it was wet, and yeah. I was terrified of just yeah. <laughs> opening it up. Very solid bike yeah. on the road, much more solid than the other two, but to me a bit too solid, but very light, fantastic yeah. noise that, of the three of them. That's, yeah, beautiful sound. That's Lovely. the one to be uh, going past the... Uh, but all of them, um, great bikes, all of them. I mean, uh, in terms of what they're all doing, I thought they were all fantastic and very easy to just jump on and ride quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I haven't ridden a bike like that for a long time. And it was amazing how quickly it was to just get used to it. Yes. Get used to the sharpness of the brakes, the acceleration, and, and just how light they are yeah. and, and the handling. And, and it's very confidence inspiring. Yeah. Good. All right. So we've got to pick one, Simon. Kawasaki for me, Country Mile. Loved it. Brilliant. BMW for me, a smooth, all around, fantastic bike that does everything. Great. Okay. Brilliant. And what about? You. For me, well, I, I can stay with the BMW. Yes, <laughs> I would. Um, I want. I'm, I'm actually very, very keen to try the Aprilia on the track because yes, yes, you know, the yes. conditions aren't as windy and wet as they were. With the rear plugs in, with the plugs in, that no, it's great noise. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I take yeah. take your point, Simon. I it felt like really. Yeah. Get once you got used to the way that engine works. Yes. You can climb all over it. Yes. Really. Make it work. Make it yeah. Work. Yeah. As a track bike, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. 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 But as a bike to live with on a day-to-day -day basis, no. Does everything for you. Then I'll, 
milestone within the league. Yeah. What else is happening in the news? Well, I think everybody's talking TT. Also, we've got Guy Martin because of the, the BBC show, the, the boat that Guy built. Um, there's again wider interest. And so I think this year is going to be an incredibly exciting year. What do you reckon to Guy and the Relentless? This has got to be Guy's year. Um, and I think, it, I think it's a good call actually because you know how close it is between these guys and... Well it's amazing, they do six laps of 30 something or 37 odd miles. Yeah. And they come in three or four seconds apart. Yeah. There are five or six guys who can win this thing. You know, you, you can never count out John McGuinness. No. Um, so you've only got to look at somebody like Ian Hutchinson who came to win five TTs last year. So there's always the chance of a, of a new guy on the block. And then you've mm. got the really experienced old hands mm. and, um, you know, guys right up there. Um, and then I've discovered a couple of things in Most Likely News <coughs> today. Um, and the first thing I thought was quite interesting is the insurance. And there's a chance that if you declare that you want a pillion on your insurance policy that uh, you'll be turned down. And that's coming out of Aviva, one of the biggest mm. backers in insurance. They're, they're actually saying that if you are riding a sports bike or a larger bike and you're putting a pillion on there, that they might not be able to quote for you, which I thought was mm. amazing. One of the things we've got to look forward to as well is uh, National Ride to Work Day, which um, for 2011 is on the 20th of June, um, and a great opportunity for people and a good excuse for people to get their <laughs> bikes out of their garages and um, show more car drivers all of the benefits of um, two wheels. If we need an excuse. Yeah. If we need an excuse. But, um, and particularly for young Soph, who I think by then will have done her CBT, and I, she's taking delivery of something, isn't she, to test? Yeah, well, um, I'm getting a bit nervous because it's been three weeks and um, all I've seen so far is a helmet. Yes. But, um, but she's going to have to get her skates on because um, we've lined her up with a uh, Piaggio Vespa. That's uh, the, 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 the new one, isn't it? The exactly. Yeah, it's a new bike. Um, mm. or it's a remake of an old classic bike, actually, a really popular model that you know, yeah. I remember and yeah, I'm sure yeah, you I do. I remember riding up and down some illegally up and down some road somewhere without a helmet on. Actually, no, it was a farm track, so it probably wasn't as illegal as I thought. But that's, so it's got the three-speed twist clutch thing and the foot brake. The foot brake, yeah, it's exactly the same shape as it was uh, in the brilliant. 60s and 70s. Brilliant. And um, yeah, Piaggio bringing it back. And um, just in time for um, Soph to ride to <laughs> a, an event that's been organized for the uh, National Ride to Work Day. Brilliant. Um, and then finally, um, there's the YouTube clip that I sent you the other day <laughs> of the, uh, the intelligent motorbike that can um, spot when an accident happened and I discovered that BMW is uh, talking about a car that looks for bikes. Yeah, I haven't read that, so what's the, the, what's the story? Well, more technology. Uh, it's uh, supposed to be able to spot the characteristics of a motorbike, and, uh, but I don't know much more than that. Um, we'll do a little bit of digging. I'll speak to BMW about it mm. um, and see if we can find out more. Yeah. But uh, it's that thing of when technology starts to take over, which yeah. is, you know, we're seeing cars that are self-parking and, and, yep. and et cetera, et cetera. So. Yep. Well, anything that improves safety is, um, you know, is welcome for bikers. and. Um, yeah. yeah, in fact, safety is an important point, and uh, one of the things that we will be doing soon is taking a look at safety in motorcycle clothing. Um, mm. Soph was down at uh, the motorbike show back in December last year, and one of the things she did spend a lot of time doing was looking at safety. So that's coming up in in a future future episode. So here we are in Essex, and I found a man who um, restores bikes and is um, enthusiastic about all things Italian. Michael Watlin, hello Mick. Hello Paul. So talk to us a bit about the bikes you've got in the garage here behind us. Uh, well as a boy I was into um, a particular Italian scooter, so I've always had leanings towards Italians. Um, uh, just lately I've been a, a Japanese fan. The perfect marriage of the two is my Bimota. <laughs> this is half of a Bimota SB3. It's in pieces at the moment, being tidied up, the poor old girl getting a bit scruffy. This particular bike bears chassis number 9, so it's 9 of a total production run of 402. But it's the first one to appear in the UK, it was the very first imported to this country. Well, it's a GS1000 engine, and I think in the brochure they call it lightly tuned, but I'm quite sure there's no tuning 
it's a question of uh, air filters, carburetor, carburetor air, the air filters, and the exhaust system, which is peculiar. It's a bimotor part. It's not um, not inherited from the from the Suzuki at all. It was shown at the Earl's Court Motorcycle Show in 1979. Um, I, I've had it for less than a year, um, but I love it already. <laughs> <laughs> the bike you bought, I mean, you bought it off the guy who had bought it from brand new, was that right? I bought it, but it was his son actually, but that he wanted more of a tourer. After all these years, he thought his time wasn't um, best spent charging around on a sports type machine and he wanted more of a tourer. And let's have a look at some of the other bits because um, you mentioned the swing arm. Yeah this has been refinished. And it looks, um, I mean that's a strange looking thing for a swing arm. It, it's pretty unconventional to have it coming back out to what looks like it wraps around the engine. Well it, it does. How does it fit on? It does because the pivot the pivot points are, are it, on the same plane as the as the chain, as the drive sprocket so the chain tension stays the same regardless you mentioned that you've got the original copy of the MCN that this bike oh is yes in. yeah right here is the actual advert that went into motorcycle weekly for this bike is that right that's what it appears to be yeah listing the three specifications they offer for the SB3 and what they're saying is that um, the GS1000 units are scarce so they will take all the parts required from a brand new GS1000, leaving them with a dead rolling chassis to sell. Oh, I can't imagine ever, ever parting with that, ever. No, no. When I'm 101 and I'm right, still <laughs> riding it, I'll let you know. Well, that's it for another week, but we will be back in a fortnight. Look forward to seeing you then.